Numbers chapter 4, uh, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families by the house of their fathers, from thirty years old upward even unto fifty years old, all that enter into, what's the next? The host. Do you know that that word actually means the army? So the tabernacle can unveil for us spiritual warfare. And God just recently began to unveil that for me. Now I've known that it's possible almost since I started the tabernacle, because I read their scripture and said, what in the world does that mean? And he didn't tell me for years. But it's when we came here, and God began to speak to us about reaching the Jewish community, not with, quote, tracts and all that stuff. Now, they have their place, but with a love that makes them jealous and wanting to know our Messiah. Before I forget, I want to greet those online. I usually forget it because when I do the online stuff for my ministry, it's online. Everybody knows, you know. So I don't, I don't greet them, I just head right into it. So, but I want to greet them and I want to thank you for, for uh, tuning in. I probably will say some things that will make you go tilt, but hang steady, because Scripture is about to be unveiled, not just here, but God is about to unveil some things that the world has never seen before and the church has never seen before. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the honor of kings to search out the matter. I want to be a king. How about you? And so that means I have been searching all week. <laughs> all right. Our portion is Exodus 27.20 to Exodus 28.43. And this is lesson three of the Torah teaching. Today, there are two things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the lamps, the oil for the lamp. And we're going to talk about the high priest robes. So those of you that would like to know what I'm get up in, we're going to help you understand the spiritual reality of that and its relativeness to our priesthood as the believer. Okay? Remember, the lamp oil and its relationship to the parable of the ten virgins. We talked about that earlier. Whenever God uses something in Scripture, like the lampstand, he spent a lot of time talking about the lampstand and the oil. And we just pass over it when we come to the New Testament thinking we understand. One of the days, one of the things God is doing today is he's making men and women who flow, who, who, out of whom flow the anointing. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, the oil for the lamp was from olive berry. The real virgin oil, now catch this, the real virgin oil is the pressures of the berries against each other. In other words, just the pressure of being in the vat squeezes the oil out. Now I found this out from a, an Italian lady whose family owns an orchard, an olive orchard, in Italy. And I said, what is virgin oil? Because you read virgin oil, extra virgin oil, extra extra virgin oil. <laughs> you know. But the true virgin, and by the way, they never put that on the market. It is for the consumption of the owner alone. So when God begins to produce anointing here just by our pressure on one another, he keeps it for himself. He treasures it. The pressures that we exert on one another, by that which every joint supplieth. You are a joint supplying me. All right. I didn't say you smoke a joint. I said, 
You are a joint supplying something that I need. And if I despise you, I despise what God has given to produce anointing in me. Okay? So I, I think we've got to learn a new respect for the body of Christ. And for the members in particular. And there are also members in peculiar. But members in particular. All right. The weight of the olive berries put pressure on the others in the vat, causing oil to drain to the bottom of the vat. That vat would have a tap at the bottom to drain out the oil collected that way. That's the body of Christ functioning together. And where a body is not allowed to function, there's no oil. As I said, I'm just going to scatter some seeds and maybe I'll have to duck when you guys start throwing things. I don't know. All right. There, then there is the oil that goes through the crushing process. There is crushing. In fact, he said, a broken and a contrite or a crushed heart thou will not despise. There's something that comes out of the crushing that he honors and he uses both in the incense and in the lampstand, and for the anointing oil. Do not despise the crushings you go through. God is producing oil. The paste produced was then placed in sacks, crushed again, which released the rest of the oil and sifted out the pulp. How many know that we do have some pulp? Some of us think we have more pulp than oil. But cheer up, the squeeze is coming. All right. In some processes, hot water was poured over the remains or the washing of water by the word, hot water, was poured over the rest of the paste and the oil rises to the... Lord, does the oil rise to the top in my vessel? When I'm going through crushing, what rises to the top? I pray it's the anointing oil. That oil was then skipped off, skimmed off and placed in containers. This processing is an experience that comes when we are ministering unto the Lord, not necessarily in the outer court or in the salvation dimension. So if we do not move on in our walk with God, it's possible there will not be anointing. What about the spiritual parallels? The parable indicates that we can have oil in our vessels as well as oil in our lamps. In this one, we have oil in the vessel. Okay? Okay? And uh, can you give me the matches over there? I trimmed the wick on this. I meant to bring another one that didn't have a trimmed wick. But we're going to talk about the wick in a minute. But would you like that? That is olive oil. I stole it from my wife's kitchen. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, stealing is scriptural. Let him that stole steal. No more let him labor with his hands the thing that is right. It depends on where you put the emphasis, whether it's on the right syllable or not, right? <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm sorry for some of you that are watching from another land and English is not your language. <laughs> but I'm a Canadian, what can I say? <laughs> eh? <laughs> All right. Now, it's important that we not just have oil in our lamp. And one of the things I really believe God is wanting to teach us is how to have oil in our vessel as well. Too many come to church and they feel the anointing. They have oil in their lamp. But how many know that the lamp, the light goes out. Almost like that. Um, 
And we need to know that we have the ability to put oil in our vessels. And I'm crying out to God, Lord, would you make that more clear? Because I don't want to get to the midnight hour and everybody's lamp was going out, not just the wise or foolish virgins. And it says they arose and what? You mean at the end of the age there's coming a trimming of lamps? Why? Because if you look at this, if this had burned a little longer, the top would have been black and I would have had to trim it in order that it continued to burn. Here's something else the Lord said to me, and we, we'll touch on this again, but um, he said, Bill, remember, they needed the lamps through the night at the feast. What you have in your vessel should last through the tribulation night. Whether you're speaking of a personal tribulation night or whether you're speaking of the great tribulation night. God wants to produce men and women who last the night time with light. The indication is that the foolish had oil in their lamps but not no oil in their vessels. Without oil in the vessel, there's not enough to last the rest of the night of tribulation until the morning comes. They, they all had to have oil. That oil had, how many know that if you go in someplace at midnight, you need light all night? So they had to have oil in the vessel. They arose and trimmed their lamps. They cut away that which had burned. We're going to talk about the wick in a minute. All right. Even though the bridegroom had come, they still needed oil for the rest of the night. Each contributed oil for the light of the wedding. There was still oil available after the door was shut, or the five foolish virgins would not have come back. These are sobering truths that we need to look at. Because you see, we've been taught a bill of goods. And we need to look, sometimes we know these incidents too well. We think we know what they say, and we miss the obvious. By the way, the foolish virgins were saved. The foolish virgins had the baptism of the Holy Spirit but they didn't have oil in their vessel. You know, if I take this and I submerge it in water, that's called baptism, but nothing gets on the inside. Hello? I need more than just be baptized. I need to be filled. We need to ask the Lord to teach us how to store up the oil that we might become those who pour oil and catch the wording of this in Zechariah 4 and 12. Those who pour oil out of themselves. It doesn't say they were conduits. It says they were sources. God wants you to become a source of the anointing wherever you go. Also a Joseph type of experience. There's coming a time when we will need to have oil in our vessels because we're being invited into a place where we'll, we will be closed in with him and not able to buy oil. He's inviting you to an enclosing with him. But you bring the oil. The oil required... Tending. The pure oil was used primarily in the holy place as oil for the lampstand. They could only be tended by the five ministries as they ministered unto the Lord. Aaron and his four sons. And how many know that got cut down? To three. 
Aaron and his two sons. Could only be tended by those who were willing to go into the holy place and minister unto the Lord. Yeah, oh, but, but wait a minute. You mean in ministering unto the Lord, my wick gets dirty? We'll talk about that in a minute. All right. They needed to be trimmed morning and evening. The oil needed to be replenished morning and evening. You'll notice in the book of Acts that there were several times when there was a visitation of the Holy Spirit, not just the day of Acts, or not, not just the day of Pentecost. We need the oil changed. I need an oil change. <laughs> Okay, the, the lamp has a wick for burning flammable liquids such as oil. The wick drawing up the fluid by capillary attraction to feed the flame. Wicks were made of flax, Isaiah 42 and 3 and Isaiah 43, 17. They were peeled or peeled rush or hemp. All, olive oil was the fluid generally burned in the ancient lamps. That's why it's a type of the Holy Spirit. But what is the wick a type of? The wick is an essential part of the light. I want to make that clear before I go on because I'm going to say some things that might just rattle your cage. Hopefully it'll rattle it so you can get out of it. All right. <laughs> The wick is an essential part of the light. It's a type of the flesh that's burned away as life in the spirit is exercised. Look at this. This little fella. I have a number of illustrations and I love them, can't you tell? But look, the wick is in here and in this, it's soaked in the oil. But the flame draws it up. There are things that you are focusing on in your life that God isn't yet. Because your wick is not soaked enough in the anointing to burn it off. Let me wind it back. There are things in your life that you want gone. They're not, they're not godly. They're not right. They're... They may be weights as opposed to sin, but they're things that you know God wants to deal with. But you're trying to deal with them before you're soaked enough in the Spirit for it to burn. Okay? Without the wick, there would be no light. The wick is important. Sometimes we minimize the wick and focus on the oil. Both are essential for the light. But in order for the wick to burn, there has to be a saturation of oil. We need God to come. We need to give ourselves to the Spirit of God. Remember that the Lord inhabits what? So if we don't praise, does he come? I believe we're coming to a day when God will just order a praise service. Not only will he order a praise service, but there'll be very little word because he wants to come and visit us and open up our spirits in new dimensions that have not been opened before. I'm not putting down the word. You know that. You know I love the word. And I love to teach the word. But there comes a time when we need to minister unto the Lord at the lampstand and at the altar of incense in the light of the word. Remember, there were three pieces of furniture in the holy place, not just one. It wasn't just the lampstand representative of all the Holy Spirit does and is, but there was the table of showbread which balanced it out but it was done in reading the word or 
partaking of the word was done in the light that was produced by the Holy Spirit. And then both of them meant, I call it a funnel, funneling you into the holiest of all. Okay? And that was, by the way, the thing that represents worship was the gateway into the holiest of all. How many know I could preach? <laughs> In order to produce the light, it, the wick had to be stretched down into the reservoir and be soaked with oil, drawing the oil to the flame which gives light. By the way, that flame was started by a coal from off the altar. That original flame came out of the holiest of all and lit the altar and they, they were required to keep the fire going. So you could say that the lamp was lit from the holiest of all. Because that coal never died. Coal never died. All right. It had to be trimmed morning and evening. The oil had to be topped up in the morning and evening as well as along with the sacrifices and the incense offered at that time. The high priest clothed, catch this, clothed for glory and beauty. If we are the priests that God is making, he wants to clothe us with glory and beauty. Stop putting yourself down. It really is a focus on you. It really, when you, when you keep putting yourself down and not saying, listen, he said, I'm not to think of myself, how? More highly than I ought to think. But religiously, we've interpreted that as you don't think of yourself. That's not what it says. There's a level of, he, of thinking of myself. It's called thinking what he thinks of me. I don't care what the facts are. I want to know the truth. And the truth is, what does God think of me? Yeah. And I, you know, I can't walk with God unless I agree with him. And the problem with God is he's never wrong. <laughs> so what he thinks about me is right, whether I think so or not. Oh, I wish we could hear that. It would change our thinking. It would get rid of our stinking thinking and rid of the wicks. By the way, before we go on, I want to say something about the wick that the Lord dropped in my spirit some years ago. I said, Lord, what does the wick represent? He said, the wick is me, me burning the wick is me burning the wickedness out of you. You know, I do play on words from time to time. But the Lord really impressed me with that and he said I want to burn the wickedness out of you but in order for that to happen you have to be saturated with the Holy Spirit Hallelujah. so the high priest clothed for glory and beauty in Deuteronomy 10 8 and 9 at that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord all three dimensions, the outer court dimension, they stood before the Lord. The holy place dimension, they stood before the Lord. And the holiest of all, the high priest stood before the Lord. Standing before the Lord. I'm trying to, uh, can't get ahead of myself here. Now, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him. Your call to ministry is not to the people. Remember in Mark it says, And Jesus ordained twelve that they should what? Is it 3.14? That they should be with him and that he should send them forth. Our Bible schools and cemeteries, uh, seminaries <laughs> basically train you to minister to the people but not to minister to the Lord. And God is looking for a people 
who will enter into the holy place and minister unto him. To bless in his name unto this day. Levi has no part nor inheritance with the brethren. Now catch this. If we are the priesthood of the believer, the Lord is his inheritance. God is making me into a priest, so he is my inheritance. I do not fully know what it means to inherit God. Hello? Exodus 28 and 2, And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and for, glo for glory and beauty. Thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted. Wise what? Not wise-headed. You can be wise-hearted and not be wise-headed. Wise-hearted knows where your source is. Wise-headed thinks he knows. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron, Aaron's garments to consecrate him him that he may what this is a refrain when talking about the priesthood not minister unto the people but minister unto the Lord in the priest's office Exodus 28 and 4 and all these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate one of these an ephod a robe a broidered coat a mitre by the way my keeper is bigger than your keeper um, and I'm going to keep it. No. I love to play with words. A mitre, a girdle. They shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons that he may minister, where? Unto me in the priest's office. Exodus 28, 5 and 6. And they shall take, now these are what is used to make this garment. And each of them has a spiritual significance that we need to catch and let God work in us. And they shall take gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen with cunning work. The importance of the priest's garment is emphasized by the extensive portion giving details concerning the making of them. He was the highest ministry in the earth at the time, directly under Moses. They, the, they relate to the truths, and this is where I believe God wants to emphasize concerning the priesthood of the believer. We've heard a lot about it, but do we know much about it? And some of that is because we haven't looked at the clothing to know what priest being clothed as a priest looks like. Jesus is the high priest of our profession in Hebrews 3 and 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, what does the word consider mean? Think about, meditate upon, ponder. Consider the, high, the apostle and high priest of our profession. What profession? The priesthood profession. Okay? Christ Jesus. He is making us. He, by the way, that word making is a word of... The swear word that the folks in the, at the college told me not to say very often. He is making. Making is a word of... Process. Or as the Canadians would say, process. Okay? Revelation 5 and 10. This necessitates allowing God to work the Psalms, kingship preparation, in us, as well as the maturing in applying Proverbs, the instructions and training of the king mentality and nature. God is making us both kings and priests. He wanted to make Israel a royal priesthood. They refused and they put a man between themselves and God. 
I think maybe some of our churches are set up that way. It's not God's highest. A spiritual understanding of the principles laid out by God for the Levites would help us understand God making us priests. Growth in priesthood principles from Levi to Melchizedek. He's a priest forever after the order of... I cannot understand Melchizedek unless I understand Levi. In fact, God said to me one day, and it shook me around. I was studying in Malachi. He said, Bill, unless you walk in the principles of the Levitical priesthood, spirit, the spiritual principles, you will never be called into the order of Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek is the highest order of priesthood, not Aaron. Okay? And so God is saying, I want you with me. Jesus is saying, I want you with me. Come follow me. Well, I'll follow you to the end of Aaron, but I'm not sure I want to go to Melchizedek. Huh? The garments of the high priest speak of the characteristics and nature of Jesus primarily. But if he is the head and I am part of the, then they apply to me as well. Put ye, and, and I've, I've done a number of scriptures here because we need to catch this. Romans 13 and 14. But put ye on who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 27. For as many as of you as have been baptized into Christ have what? Put on Christ. By the way, that's not just water baptism. It's also baptism of the Spirit. Okay. Colossians 3.12 Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. And here's the question. Portions of the clothing of the high priest are these things mentioned. And I didn't have time to go into it. How many know that this would take a lesson by itself? But we're trying to drop some things and open your mind to, to let God be able to speak to you in dimensions you may not have been in before. Why? Because he is making you a priest. Doesn't say I make me a priest. Doesn't say men make me a priest. He makes me a priest. In Second Chronicles 6 and 41, Now therefore arise, O Lord, Lord God, into thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with... Oh, you mean salvation is one of the pieces of clothing I put on spiritually. I think we need to revise our spiritual closet. In Isaiah 60, verse 10, 61, verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with what? Plural. Do I know what they are? Or do I need to begin to seek the Lord and say, Lord, I need to know what the garments of salvation are so I can wear them properly. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as the bride adorneth herself with jewels. Ezekiel 16, 10 through 13. By the way, if you interpret this passage spiritually, you'll find the condition of most who get saved. They follow this pattern. I clothe thee also, uh, if you start from verse 1. I clothe thee also with broidered work. Remember what we said last week about broidered work? What happens? Ouch. <laughs> That's a good description. But the needle pierces through the cloth or the linen, and the pattern gets worked into your life. A pattern of his character, a pattern of his nature, a pattern of who he is, so that you manifest he. 
you manifest him. This is an important understanding of the process. You could say, God, why am I going through this? There may not be a cause, but there may be a reason. God said to Satan, you move me against Job without cause. How many have been taught to look for a cause when something's going wrong? And so when God doesn't show you a cause, do you believe him or do you still keep looking? You can say, ouch. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Because sometimes, God did, it was God that said, look at Job. God drew Satan's attention to Job. A perfect and an upright man, one that loved God and eschews evil or runs from evil. God called him perfect. At the end, God's testimony of Job had not changed. Job did not sin. God stripped him in order to reclothe him with new clothing, take him into a new dimension, take him from hearing God to seeing God. God wants to take us out of the dimension we're in and move us forward. I wish I had time to go into this more in depth, but Ezekiel 16, 10 to 13 talks about what he clothed us with. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, he talks about this, and I'm still asking God about this, okay? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, and for in this we groan earnestly to be what? Clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Are we resisting the clothing of God? Because we don't understand the process. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed or naked but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. I was in a convention one, in this, one time, and this brother from Jamaica was preaching. Wonderful brother. And he said this, Victory is a great big mouth, for death is swallowed up in victory. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's time we let Victory, swallow death in our lives. All right? Revelation 3.18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. God wants us clothed. So let's look at this. The balance. In the area of being clothed, there's a balance. There are times when we're told to array ourselves. Revelation 3.18. We just read that scripture. Revelation 19.7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. In what? Well, I think I read about that in the priest robes, didn't I? Are you catching this? There's a continuity in Scripture that we've missed. And that's in the Old Testament. My goodness. All right. In fine linen, pure and white, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of saints. There are other times when it says God or someone else clothes us. Moses was told to clothe Aaron and his sons in Exodus 40, 12 to 14. In Ezekiel 16, 10 to 13, God clothed her. And those other scriptures are there as well, which speak uh, for a moment in Joshua, or in Zechariah 3 and 4, it said, strip Joshua, 
So here he stands naked before all of heaven. And then, what's the first thing they put on him? A hat. Do you know why? Because if they hadn't have changed his mind first, it would have contaminated his clothes. We must experience both at the instruction of the Holy Spirit. The colors are significant, representing white linen righteousness, the basic material upon which all needlework or embroidery is done. When God is bringing, he wants the base of everything you wear to be his righteousness. Right, and this struck me yesterday when I was going through the notes once more. Righteousness is glorious and beautiful. It's been described to us as something we just really have to get a hold of and get on and as something difficult. No, he said it's glorious and it's beautiful. Lord, change our, pers our perspective or our perspective of righteousness. Blue thread, heavenly vision, and the prophetic. The prophetic is glorious and beautiful. The enemy is trying to drag it through the dirt these days. Okay? But it's glorious and beautiful. The vision of heaven is glorious and beautiful. And God wants to work it, to needlework it into our character and nature. Remember when, when the, two of the 70 elders prophesied in the camp and didn't make it to, to the ordination service. Uh, what, what, did, what, what was Moses' comment? Would to God all God's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit in every one of them. God wants us to be prophetic. I believe we're coming to a day when God's going to raise up prophetic voices that nothing is hid from them. God will do nothing except he reveal it to his servants, the prophets. So when I didn't see something coming, I asked God to increase my prophetic ability. I don't blame the other prophets. I didn't see it either. Come on. He said that's possible. Therefore, that becomes my standard. All right. Scarlet thread, blood of the lamb, the priestly dimension. Purple thread, the nature of the king, the book of wisdom, or books of wisdom, and Proverbs worked into us, maturing into a king nature, embroidered by the piercings of God. Lord, would you lift me above the bottom so I don't just see, what? The mess, but I see the pattern. Come on. God's working a pattern in your life. Let, let, I've got another illustration here. How many know what this is? Or am I dating myself? <laughs> this is for making music staff on, a, would, would have been a blackboard in my day. Today it could be a whiteboard. And you draw it and the, it keeps the, all the lines parallel. So one day I'm fussing at God. I know you don't do that, but I do. Uh, I'm fussing at God and saying, God, what are you doing? I, I, I'm so immature. He said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean I'm not? He said, in this area, you're mature. In this area, you're immature. When that goes on in my life, there are areas where I'm immature, areas where I'm mature. All at the same time. No wonder I'm confused. <laughs> Some of you can relate. I can tell you're laughing hard. All right. In Isaiah 53 and verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him smitten or stricken. Smitten of who? How many have blamed God for your smitings? You're in good company. 
They blamed him. They said, he's going through this because he's done something wrong. No, he's going through this because God's doing work. Big difference. Sorrow can pierce, according to 1 Timothy 6 and 10, and Luke 2 and 35 says it pierced. Let's look at that. That's a powerful scripture in Luke 2 and 35. This is a principle of God and may cause you to understand some things that you've gone through that you didn't understand. Luke 2 and 35. Simeon is prophesying to Mary. Now, he'd prophesied about Jesus, but he's prophesying to Mary. And so in verse 35, Yea, a sword shall pierce thine own soul also. What happens when, 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 that, when, when that happens to me? That the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. When I am pierced, there are those who say, Well, I wonder what he's done wrong now. I wonder what God's correcting him on now. Come on. There are others who just disregard me because I went through it. He, he can't be of God because this happened. I'm being pierced. Their heart is being exposed. Let me say that again. I've been through this. I'm here in spite of the church. I'm here because I love Jesus. I'm here because God called me and God carried me through when I was a basket case in ministry. By the way, ministers can be basket cases. It depends on how the basket is weaved, what it can carry when he's done. All right. Uh, oh, I'm having fun. All right, Isaiah. We need to hear that principle there in Luke. Prophetic word. Prophetic word. Not just to Mary, but to you and I. In Isaiah 53 and 5, But he was wounded. For our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Uh, so one of the first booklets I wrote years ago was called, O oh Lord, It Hurts. <laughs> and it was based on a, a passage in Proverbs, but one of the things the Lord said to me, he said, Bill, by my stripes of correction... You are healed. How many know that took a totally different ball game there? He took me to the big leagues. I was no longer playing in the minors. Why? Because we don't, we read it and think we know it. And we think we understand it. There is a process of God that every negative thing that happens to you can bring forth life. The enemy means it for evil. God. Joseph said, God meant it for good. Amen. I want the God meant. I don't want what man went, meant. I don't want their side of things. I want what God means it for. Amen. Isaiah 53 and 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. If I'm following in his steps, do you mean I might go through some bruisings? He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He's talking about our high priest. Therefore, he's talking about what he wants to do with us and through us. In Exodus 28 and 24, And thou shalt put two wreathen chains of gold in the Two rings which are in the ends of the breastplate. I want to talk for a few moments about the breastplate. There's so much, as you already can guess, in this. But there are certain things that I feel God is after. And God wants to draw our attention to. 
Now, two recent chains of gold in the two rings which are at the end of the breastplate. Recent chains are also described as cords, in, with the, which speaks of a dimension of refining that takes strands of gold and braids them together. There are certain things in your life that God is going to do sovereignly because if you touch them, you'd contaminate them. And one of the things, isn't it interesting, it's the breastplate of judgment that's held by sovereignty of God. Hello. See, we have sit in the seat of judgment like the Pharisees. But you know, when I read about the tab tabernacle, he doesn't speak from the judgment seat. Where does he speak from? Well, then should everything he speaks be pregnant with mercy? When we look at others, do we look at them from the judgment seat? Or do we look at them from the mercy seat? We'll talk about the ark in one of the later lessons and some things that God showed us about that. But... We need to begin to depend on the sovereignty of God in areas where he talks about his sovereignty. It's important to realize that they could make golden thread. Gold is symbolic of the divine nature. First, uh, 2 Peter 1 through 4. Letting God, or 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Letting God weave in this into our character and nature. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. It is possible that the gold thread was also embroidered into the garments. That's not clear in the description, but it's quite possible. In the spirit, the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, was clothed in human flesh. He manifested four major expressions. His humanity is seen in the book of Luke, and his favorite title for himself was Son of Man. Many more times than he's called Son of God in the Gospels. The prof prophetic nature, the prophet like unto Moses is seen in John, also the divine Son manifesting the heavenlies. I think we need to re-examine his life in the light of that he manifested heaven on earth. Because some of the things that he did, we would not call them heavenly. Would we? He got involved in some things that were heavenly, but we didn't see it. We don't see it because we focus on the negative and not on the result. The priesthood, the servant ministering to the people in Mark, also the dimension of intercession. The priesthood. The king, this is detailed in Matthew, especially his royal lineage, establishing his right to kingship. And so the breastplate of judgment, we haven't got time to read through this, but let me ask the questions at the end of this slide. Is it related to other breastplates in Scripture? Is the breastplate of judgment related to other breastplates in Scripture? I believe it is. Obviously, we know the breastplate of righteousness, but what about 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8, the breastplate of faith and love? Are they the balance to judgment? Just a question. Now, I want to talk for a moment uh, about why the breastplate. Exodus 28 and 20, uh, 29 and 30. And Aaron shall put the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his, what? Heart. When he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thummim. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And then he carried the nation on his shoulders. And thou shalt take two, uh, Exodus 28, 9 through 12. And thou shalt take two onyx stones, six 
their names on one stone, six on the other, according to their birth, with the work of an engraver, tattooer. How many know that he says, I am engraved on his hands? Do you realize that means tattooed? God believes in tattoos. We won't go there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not to validate anything it's just true if he if he loves me so much he tattoos me in the palm of his hand oh my now let's slip down to the end thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for the stones on the shoulder, this should stay on my shoulders, but it doesn't. Okay. Shoulders of the ephod for stones, a memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. He now has them on his heart, and he has them on his shoulders. There are two ways God required the high priest to carry representation of the people in before him. The two onyx stones which had the six names on each one, and he bore them on his shoulders. And here's the question, is, an is this an illustration of Isaiah 9 and 6? And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And engraved stones were placed in the breastplate. Uh, you mean, not only do I need to be refined, he's going to tattoo me again? And engraved stones were placed in the breastplate of judgment over the heart of the high priest. Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth into the holy place. Philippians 1.7 says this, and think about this. Even it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I, what? Have you where? You mean they lived in the heart? Of the Apostle Paul? There's a dimension of that. How I many we don't understand that? But it's saying this to ministry. God wants to place people in your heart. Not just on your mind. But he wants to place them in your heart. How many know when, when it's in your heart. There's a difference. You have acquaintances and you like them. But you've got some people in your heart. And you do all you can to help them. Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are partakers of my grace. 2 Corinthians 6 and 11. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is... Oh, you mean it can hold more people. You see how we take the old covenant... And illustrate the new. If I do away with the old covenant. I will not understand the new. Remember that Paul in Acts. It says he preached for two years. Teaching the kingdom. All he had was the Old Testament. Right. Have you looked for the kingdom in the Old Testament? Hello. I'm working on a series of courses right now because God wrote that scripture in my heart. He said, you've got to go through the whole Old Testament and show where the kingdom is. How many know that's a big job? Not only that, I can't do it unless he draws me to it. And here's what happens. When God says, stop now, I'm in the middle of, of the historical books, he said, stop. I said, why? He said, because there's some things got to be worked in you before I can give you the understanding of the kingdom in the historical books. And then 2 Corinthians 7 and 3, For I have said before that you are in our hearts to die or live with you. That's commitment. The vital principle, and here's something God arrested me with. You will only have as large a ministry as the number of people your heart can hold. 
God will take us through experiences both negative and positive, the purpose of which will be to enlarge our heart. Psalm 4 and 1 says, My heart is enlarged through distress. Here's the problem. The root word of distress is stress. <laughs> I don't like that scripture. I'm going to redact it. All right. <laughs> Isn't that the way we feel sometimes? Okay. To clean out and enlarge the heart. There's two reasons. To clean out and enlarge the heart. First of all, to hold more of himself. Second of all, to prepare a place that he might place people in a sheltered, safe place. How many know we need renovation? My heart needs renovation. The breastplate of judgment, discretion, or discernment over the heart of Aaron, the high priest, represents an expansion on these truths that we've just talked about. An interesting study would be the clothing he wants, us, wants to clothe us with. You know, some of us are operating in rusty armor. We never take it off. We don't oil it. We don't take it off. We sleep in it. And we don't know the other, we, we're not wearing the high priest robes because we got our armor on. Well, we won't go there. There's much that could be said about the oil in the priest robes that we may allude to in later in this series. It's important to ask God to show us the applications of God making us priests unto our God. If I will submit to the cleansing and preparation, he will clothe me with what he's promised. And I will become a mature priest unto God for a people that he will assign to me. Consider this. Now, I know this was Jesus, and sometimes we use that as an excuse. But here's what he said. Remember, he's the head, and so what happens to the head comes down the whole body. Okay? John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those whom thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture may be fulfilled. I'm beginning to ask, Lord, who have you given me? Who have you given me? I want to keep everyone whom you've given me. I don't want to clutch them. You know what happens when you clutch people? It's like a grease pig. <laughs> you can't hold on to it. But I want to have them in my heart. So let's pray. Father, our hearts are exercised to cry out to you as we read concerning the raiment of glory and beauty that you clothed your earthly high priest with. We recognize that there is symbolism and types and shadows in them that we have not yet been, or that have not yet been opened. We pray with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If so be, for in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but we would be clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life in me. Come, Lord Jesus. Prepare me for this clothing, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Yes. Turn it on, dear. One piece of this that really just stood out to my spirit this morning as a bit of a um, rebuke is too strong of a word, but like a, a, a watch out here kind of a 
concept was the thought of our ministry being to God. That it's not about us and what we like and what we want to hear and what we want to do and the type of music we like and the type of service we want to have. Our ministry, the reason we gather here is to minister unto the Lord. Yes. It's what He wants so that we can be that body that He can then work through in this world. And if we're too focused on what I want and ministry for me, it puts a burden on our dear leaders, on Pastor Rachel and, and Dr. Ed, Dr. Bill and Dr. Ellie. It puts an undue burden on them that they are not meant to bear. They are here to care for our souls, but they're not here to minister to us. God is the one that ministers, and we minister to Him so that we can receive His ministry and that Holy Spirit. So it was just a wake-up call to me, really. Just make sure that I am ministering unto the Lord and not putting an expectation on this around what I want. So be encouraged wasn't meant to be a rebuke but i'm so glad that you're all here together to minister with us to the lord One more thing i want to say yes. and i meant to say it but there's how many know there's so much i can't really catch it all how many see the bells and the pomegranates on the garments skirts of the garments and one of the passages of the scripture says that they could hear the sound of the high priest. And the Lord began to deal with me about that because he said, basically, he wants to make us priests so that people hear our sound. In every move of God, there's been a fresh sound of worship. Every move of God. The Lord had me write a course on church history and I told him I wouldn't do it. Because all the church history books I've read dwell on the negatives. What Pope married who and you know all that stuff. Or what, what religious group fought this religious group. And the Lord said, no, no, I want to show you what I restored with each movement. God is getting ready to restore something to the church. And what it is, is seeing him as he is. Not a 